TV era like Trickster and Firehouse still rock the house. C.J. Snare. C.J.S.N.A.R.E. Like the drum. And I, like, it to, like the drum, yeah, and I should have been a drummer, but I'm the singer for Firehouse, and I also play keyboards. Perfect. And then you can go ahead and look at me when I interview you. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the tour that you're doing right now and who you're touring with. Is it just these particular bands, Trickster, or are you doing different bands? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the tour that we're doing right now. Uh, it's the tour that never ends. I think we started when our first album came out in 1990. We've toured with all kinds of bands, Warrant, uh, Tesla, Trickster, Rat, Cinderella, all the bands of our genre. We've been doing this for 20 some years now, so our paths have crossed with many, many bands. A lot of times when we have these big festival situations, the backstage takes on kind of a family reunion kind of thing, and it's really, really cool. So uh, we've never stopped touring. As a matter of fact, when we leave uh, Pocatello, uh, we're going to Iowa, and then we're going to be going to Salt Lake, and then Indonesia, possibly Thailand, Japan in January. We're all over the world. <laughs> American hit me. Oh my gosh, I do. That's like, wasn't well, that a three level place? It was. K Bear, sorry. <laughs> Corey, yeah, Corey, Corey, Draper, Corey Draper, Draper broke us. Yeah, he, he was a big instrumental guy in helping actually break Firehouse as a band across the nation. Really? Yes, yes, very much. K Bear was one of the uh, early people, early stations to lead with uh, our music. So do a little shout out for Corey Draper. Corey Draper, I'll make sure. Yo, CJ Draper! It's CJ Snare! Good to God. see you, man. <laughs> Well, we've been in Pocatello before, and uh, every time we come here, we're very warmly received by the audience. The people are excellent, and the scenery is second to none. I'm not just talking about the women. <laughs> it's the mountains and everything. It's wonderful here. It really is. Idaho is a great state. <laughs> Love of a Lifetime was more of an idealistic type of thing because uh, I've been married a few times. <laughs> Each one I thought was a love of a lifetime and a couple of girlfriends, things like that. But, uh, you know, a lot of people have gotten married to that song or maybe something else to that song. <laughs> you know, it's an anniversary song, whatever. And at the time that it was written, it was never intended for that. It was just to be a love song. And actually, uh, John Bon Jovi had told us he was instrumental in helping us get started to put that song away, that it would ruin our career. I think it's an interesting story. And uh, we had another song called Midnight Fantasy when we got signed to Sony Records, Epic. And they came to us and they said, you know, power ballads are kind of big right now. We'd like to bring in some outside writers to help you. And uh, we said, well, wait, we've got another one. And it was Love of a Lifetime. And so that kind of became a legacy song for us.
did we get together? Well, for this particular show, we all met at a certain airport, flew in together, and that's about how we get together. But uh, actually, uh, Bill and Michael are from Richmond, Virginia. I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time. And uh, we all kind of converged upon the same city in the Carolinas. Our original bass player, Perry Richardson, uh, was from South Carolina. And we got signed out of there. And uh, that's how we came together. And we were called White Heat at the time. After we got signed, uh, our record company executive, Michael Kaplan, said, you know, there's a lot of white bands out there. There's Great White, White Snake. Tony, TV interview. You Great White? White Snake, um, White Lion, got to change your name. So our drummer, Michael, actually came up with Firehouse after about 3,000 choices. We just couldn't decide, you know, and he came up with the best one. We thought it was in keeping with, uh, you know, the, the White Heat theme, which we were originally called. And then about 10 years ago, uh, we hooked up with our new original bass player, Mr. Alan McKenzie. He's from Ohio. <laughs> Well, I remember in 1981 when the MTV first came out, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. I didn't think how much it was going to change, the music industry. But the music industry continues to evolve constantly and change, you know, with MP3s, and everybody has, like, a whole CD collection on their telephone now, you know. So MTV has morphed into something different. I think music has morphed into something different. Technology is really pressing onward, and we as artists, it's our responsibility, and you as the audience and listeners, it's your responsibility to support us, and it's ours to keep up with the technology that is evolving at a very rapid pace. Which leads to my next question. How do you feel like the technology can help? Everybody can have access to music now on the internet. Has it affect you as an artist and your group and your sales and things like that? Oh, absolutely. Not only uh, musicians, but also people that uh, have anything that's digitized. It could be print, it can be movies, anything like that. Uh, it could be pirated. And it has been rampantly. We're originally catalog, uh, catalog artists. You know, people would have said, hey, love of a lifetime. I want to get that again. They would have gone back and gotten it. A lot of times now they'll go to some LimeWire or something like that, peer-to-peer -peer sharing, and they'll pick it up. They say, hey, I bought it once, you know, so uh, it's rightfully mine. But, uh, you know, I think they're starting to get a handle on those kind of things. They're starting to encode it. There's always going to be guys that can, you know, break into the hack into the Pentagon system or something like that. So we're trying to regulate it. We're trying to monetize and not devalue the music, you know. And I think one of the ways that we're having to evolve is to go back to the beginning. It's become more of a singles-oriented type of um, driven industry and also touring. Well, I'll tell you what, 
it's, it's, it's for the men. There'd be no band without a drummer. I mean, come on, let's get real. You gotta move them hips, honey. Gotta have some beat. Are you gonna let us come out and dance on stage with the camera with you? Guys? I, I gotta say, we won't play without you being on stage with us. How's that? <laughs> come on, it'd be great. Woo! We're gonna have a great old time coming on down tonight. That's right. You get on that stage, and which article of clothing will be coming off first? Let the shoes. That, you know, uh, the women always say the shoes. The, the, and the guys actually like it when you keep on the shoes. Step on in here, please. Okay, first name, last name, spelling. Yep. Mark, M-A-R-K, middle name Gus, G-U-S, last name Scott, S-C-O-T-T, -T, drummer of Trickster. Perfect. So tell us a little bit about how long you guys have known each other. I'll tell you what's really weird, and this I think Trickster partially is the classic American story, and this is no baloney. We don't give you effect for video or anything like that. We literally grew up together. I think I met Steve when he was nine, and I was two years old, so I was 11. We all started riding, riding dirt bikes, and the first thing... Well, even before that, I remember being in Little League and seeing Steve on an opposing team. He was always a little wise-ass. He'd go, hey, you struck out, man. I'm like, well, that son of a gun. You know, it's really funny. And it started like that. And then one day, he came around these bike trails we used to ride. He had a brand new diamond back. It was chromed out. I'm like, whoa, dude, you got a diamond back? It was cool. I go, yeah, man. We used to ride together. He'd say, you got to see me play electric guitar. I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. This little kid plays electric guitar. He's going to play Mary Had a Little Lamb for me or something like that. So I'm like, oh, boy, right, I'll go to his house. Let's, let's see you play guitar, okay? I never really, honestly, I, one time I saw a guy play electric guitar, and he was okay. But I went to Steve's house. I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. He, he whips it. The guitar's bigger than him right off the bat. I go, oh, Jesus Christ, this is going to be a mess. He whips it out. He starts rip, ripping my head off. I go, I couldn't believe it. He's playing riffs from ACDC, riffs from KISS. And I'm like, holy cow! I just couldn't believe this little 11-year-old kid is destroying me and showed me something I never saw some kid do. And I couldn't believe it. So then we go on our way, ride bikes. I said, damn, what he's doing one day? And I cruise by this garage in town on my way to the music store. And he's, I hear this noise in the garage is closed. I'm like, gee, that sounds just like that guitar I heard in that kid's house. <laughs> the garage door opens, it's him, I go, you son of a bitch, I knew it! So I said, I gotta get in that band, I gotta get in that band. So uh, they already had a drummer, and uh, I became the light guy. I said, it's gotta be around it, it was so amazing. I, I love the way he played, you know? And uh, Pete was in the band at this time, he sang great, looked great, the whole deal. So damn, I gotta get in on this. So they played this one show, I did the lights. After that, their drummer left, and I was right there waiting to get the spot, so I got in. <laughs> and, but, yeah, we literally grew up. I joined the band when I was 16 years old, and I knew the guys, I don't know, five years prior to that, so, you know, kind of silly. You know, we literally all lived in one square mile of Paramus, New Jersey. We went to the same high school, same middle school, uh, dated the same girls. I mean, ridiculous. We literally grew up together, and it's like a, a storybook kind of thing uh, that we took it to such a level, like, holy cow, you know, it just started so small. And, Ended up so ridiculous. <laughs> Let me tell you, you know what, you know what's weird, strange, and a lot of people don't seem to realize this. I, and maybe just, I don't know, maybe we didn't realize it at first either. But we come from the tri-state area, arguably one of the most populated areas of the country: New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And as far as people per square mile, it's as dense as it get, it gets aside from New York City. Uh, which, by the way, we grew up eight miles outside of New York City, so you know we we're pretty darn close and very thick. People in Idaho, let's say, can't necessarily grasp what that's like. I mean, people are crazy over where we live. So when they say, what's it like to come to a little town like this? This is rock and roll. See, I, we may come from that area, but that area was never our primary market. Our primary markets were the Midwest and the South. And those are where these small towns are, where people hunger for rock and roll. So when you come to a town like this, they're ready to kick some butt. I mean, you saw the crowd out there tonight. They're like having a great time party. This is what life is all about. And they just don't get that where we're at. You know, it's, I don't know, maybe they're concerned about the 9 to 5 thing or something. I don't know. But it's a different mentality. It's a different thing. So to come out here, we're having a freaking blast. We're at a stage of the game now where we don't do this because we have to. We do this because we want to, you know. This is awesome. It's fantastic. Positionary, yeah. <laughs> Doggy <laughs> style. Guitar. <laughs> and the spelling of it. Yes. The spelling, really? Yes. Yeah. Oh. For the camera purpose. Okay. That's a hard one. Hi, my name is Steve Brown. S T E V E 
B R O W N. And Bingo play? was his name-o. And what do you play in the band? I play guitar and uh, sing and produce and yes. dance. Yes, and okay, so Steve, tell me a little bit about um, what did you feel like when you guys got your first big video on MTV? Do you remember MTV? Of course I remember MTV. MTV changed our lives. We went from a band that was uh, sort of getting well known and within, mm -hmm. I remember... Hey guys. Oh, maybe I should it. Oh, you're awesome, nice. dude. Fuck, spray this right? on my armpits. <laughs> Alright, let's let's start again. If we can, just keep somebody out there so we can get It's cool. Thank you, brother. You're awesome. Okay, so Steve, tell us a little bit about the MTV era and what that meant to you. Well, for us, it, it, it turned us into rock stars pretty much overnight. We were a band that was together for roughly eight years before 19, you know, 1990 when Give It To Me Good, we filmed the video and it took about four months for MTV to add the video into rotation. And as soon as they added it into rotation, there was a thing called Dial MTV back then, which was the, you know, the fans call, you know, vote for, for the video. We got it. What did the video debut at? We debuted, I think, seven. at seven, and within a day, it was number one. And the difference was, we were a band that was touring. We were on the road with Striper, Dokken, but our video wasn't released yet. As soon as Give It To Me Good was released and blew up, we went from you know just a normal band to being rock stars, and it just, just was an amazing, amazing time. And we were definitely Trickster was a band that was made for MTV. You know, we were young and energetic, and we made, we were different a little bit. You know, we didn't have the same image as a lot of the bands, the Bon Jovi's and the Warrants and stuff like that. They had their thing, we had our thing. We were riding dirt bikes, you know, wearing flannel shirts and jeans. We were like the everyday kind of guys. And uh, it really resonated with people. And, you know, a million records later, uh, all we can say is, MTV, what happened? <laughs> Yeah, unreality TV. Yeah, we need to start another MTV, don't you think? I think so. Well, yeah. thank God there's VH1 classics, you know, with that metal show and stuff like that. I mean, nowadays that's pretty much the the only place where you're going to see bands like us. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was Give It To Me Good. I mean, that was that was the one. That was the first, you know, number one video we had. And it was just, it, what's crazy about it, I wrote the song in 10 minutes. And I always tell this story about how I knew the song was great and I knew it was going to be a hit when I played it for Gus. And uh, I played him the demo, which we still is on our 20th anniversary reissue, the original demo, four-track demo that I made of it, me singing it. And within, I think... 30 seconds. He was bouncing around my room at my parents' house. We played this thing. And here, he heard it before anybody. I was like, dude, you got to hear this song I just wrote. And that was it. And that, that was the song that changed all of our lives forever. inspired me well <laughs> if you listen to the title it's uh you know it, it's there's not much real you know not much deep meaning behind it but it's it's just about where you know where i was at the time and you know always wanting to have a good time loving girls and give it to me good let's have some fun let's rock and roll you know and just started strumming you know one of those things it just happened you know write a song so quick and uh, what i like to say is that song wrote itself 
you know, but just really incredible. And here we are, you know, 29 years later or whatever, since we started the band and we're still playing it and people love it. You know, we played last night up in Montana for 10,000 people and they sang every word to the song. And for a songwriter, that, that's what means the most. That's really, really cool. It's really cool when you see so many people just sing, give it to me good. That's awesome. It's so dirty. Sing this one line of that. My father was a teacher and he taught me how to live. Said, son, you gotta be someone, not take it more than you give. And that's all right. Because that's the way I am. That was the William Shatner version. <laughs> because I have to, mister! <laughs> You know, Trickster was based on Van Halen, Kiss, Cheap Trick, you know, Bon Jovi, Def Leppard. We grew up in the greatest time, the eight, early 80s. We were at every show. You know, back where we lived, there was this arena, a very famous arena called the Meadowlands Arena, where all the big bands played, and we used to go to every concert. And that's where, you know, what built our, you know, built our vision. And we used to use, we used to go to every concert, not only to see the show, but for promotional we would promo for our shows. We'd have flyers and, you know, the typical story that most bands do. But really just an amazing, amazing time. We had, we had some wild times in the parking lot of the Meadowlands <laughs> Arena. I'll tell you that. What do you think about today's music and, and the different bands and the different genres that we have now? How do you feel about that as compared to the 80s music? Um, well, it's a different world out there now. You know, I feel bad that, you know, most bands nowadays are never going to know what it's like to have a gold or platinum album. And it's awesome. Look at the crowd out here. Uh, there's over a thousand people here. 
We got Firehouse and Trickster, American Hitman, a whole slew of local bands. We're actually local as well, but we're touring with these other bands right now. It's great. Uh, they're great guys. You become like a family when you're out on the road. Everybody really takes care of everybody. You, know, every, you become one unit with all the other bands. Um, everybody should probably pay attention to Pokeroo in the future because it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Thank you.